Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for week four of our Retail Leasing Weekly Health Check. Today with us, we've got Kyle Swain from LPC Cressa, who you all know by now, and we're also joined by Ken Lamb from LPC Cressa. So welcome, Ken. Do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Uh, yep, so I've been with Ken for so I'm one of the, uh, the group that works alongside with, uh, with Kyle in the retail space, um, also providing uh, tenant advisory um, advice. Fantastic. Um, so, as always, if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the Q&A box. And also on the chat, we've got a link to a COVID-19 survey that we'd really appreciate all retailers to try and fill out so we can help use that information to advocate for government results. All right, take it away, Kyle and Ken. Thanks, Beck, and uh, um, thanks, Ken, for joining us today. Uh, Ken will add some great value to some of the um, areas we're covering off today with some real examples, I guess, of, of what we've been doing with clients over the past four weeks um, and also in question and answers. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us for week four. Um, unfortunate that we have to be doing this every week uh, in, at this time, but uh, uh, we're getting good feedback that uh, the, the content that we're covering is providing some really good information for tenants right at the moment. Um, we appreciate the feedback and, and definitely the feedback we're receiving is uh, driving the content of the following week. So today, um, Beck, if you want to go to the overview uh, of what we're covering today, uh, based on feedback and, and certainly what we've experienced in the past couple of weeks and last week, particularly with landlords, is um, the fact that the code of conduct is now in place and uh, tenants uh, are sort of seeing that as their, uh, their right, whereas landlords are seeing it as the minimum obligations that they have to, to provide some relief to uh, retail tenants. Um, what we're going to cover off is a little bit around that and what that looks like and comparing it to what LPC Cressa do with our clients in providing a, a tenant representation strategic solution and what the difference being the difference between just surviving uh, an episode like this or your business thriving, particularly post COVID-19. Um, there's certainly concerns over trading conditions post COVID-19. So a lot of our strategic solutions are based on um, not only surviving this COVID-19 period as it's defined, uh, but also your business being not just viable, but profitable post COVID-19, which, which is the desired outcome for both tenants and landlords. So we're going to go to the next slide and uh, Ken and I will talk through uh, the surviving versus the, the thriving component. I might just bring that up. The, um, the key element here is, if you see the quote on the left, um, pretty famous quote, and I'm not sure if you've seen this before, but it holds very true, particularly in what, what we see with tenants and what we negotiate with landlords. Um, in business and in life, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. Um, that's very much the case here. And uh, what the mandatory code of conduct has put in place is really, really a means for retail businesses to survive COVID-19. Um, now, when we, when we go through that, uh, the COVID-19 code of conduct, uh, essentially it provides rent relief proportionate to the impact on your biz business. And that's a mandatory obligation that, uh, that it's set out for the tenant and the landlord to work together on. Um, within the code of conduct, as you know, there's a, uh, a portion of it which should be waived rent that you never have to pay back and a portion of it that can be deferred by the landlord, meaning that they will want to recover that. Um, the code of conduct says not more than 50%. So again, the 50% and the 50%, that's, that's minimum obligations or minimum requirement of the landlord. And at the moment, that's all we're seeing from landlords being offered and um, at, at best. Uh, the reasonable recovery period is, is an area that isn't being touched at the moment by landlords, certainly not being addressed where we're seeing tenants negotiating directly with landlords. 
and it's a key area of concern for us going forward. Um, it's undefined, it's not really stated in the code of conduct what's required during that period or for how long it, it, uh, it, it's going to continue. Um, and we're seeing that as just uh, no pain for the landlord um, during that period at this stage. Um, the deferred rent portion, we covered this a little bit last week, uh, where we said deferred rent equals deferred pain. Um, any of that deferred portion is amortised over the remainder of your lease term, not less than 24 months. Um, we see that as, as uh, increasing financial distress on retail tenants after COVID-19, um, where particularly where your occupancy cost ratios have been higher than we would like to see them under normal circumstances. And then you add a deferred rent component on top of that. Um, this is where we see the highest risk of failure for retail businesses from COVID-19 is not during the impact, not during this period of restricted trade, because you do have some support from landlords during that time, but the recovery period after is the, the high risk component. Um, and how the government is set out in the code of conduct to um, repay that deferred amount to the landlord is by extending your existing lease to cover the, the minimum of 24 months to repay it. Um, and again, we see that as high risk to the tenant because our expectations uh, around the post COVID-19 period is that there will be a large correction, a significant correction to uh, market rents and, um, and leasing conditions and a lease renewal will be a far better option for retail tenants uh, post COVID-19 than extending on current lease uh, terms and conditions. So what Ken and I want to focus on is um, the strategic solutions that a, a tenancy representation firm, a, a tenant advisory firm like LPC Cressa um, uh, provide to clients and how we see the code of conduct and those components of it. Um, Ken, do you want to start off with uh, just going through those same points and, and from our perspective? How, we, how we're approaching that and the work you're doing with some of our major clients at the moment. Yep. Um, thanks, Carl. So just starting off with the, uh, the COVID-19 um, rent relief. Um, whilst um, we have had regard to the mandatory um, code, of, code of conduct um, being as a minimum, it's, uh, look, it's also, it's equally important to ensure that any relief um, provided uh, to the business uh, will be sufficient for the business moving forward during this JobKeeper program and post-JobKeeper, um, uh, uh, whilst the business um, is, I think Kyle mentioned, is in recovery mode to get back to pre-COVID uh, uh, levels. And uh, look, you know, whilst the mandatory code of conduct doesn't um, specifically document that, it's, um, look, it's certainly an important point um, that a, a business uh, will need to consider if um, they want to survive um, post-COVID. Um, in terms of uh, waiving the rent, obviously, you know, if a business um, is able to trade, that's fine, but there are still fixed um, um, overheads that a business has to pay. And it's Look, the, the ideal outcome would be to um, waive 100% of the rent, um, but equally, um, look, landlords do have obligations. Um, so it, it's, it is a negotiation uh, point um, also. Um, okay, this, is, this is where we've separated base rent versus other occupancy costs, right, in those negotiations? Right. Yeah. Um, and on the deferred uh, rent proportion, um, look, given, given that um, what what's um, look the current period is unknown. Look, our our position is um, to have a um, uh, hundred percent relief and no deferment um, as a base. Um, look, at the moment, as Scott Morrison, Scott Morrison said, landlords and tenants need to share the pain. 
um, in order to trade through this uh, period. So just based on advice um, to, to our clients, we are seeking for uh, the rent to be provided in relief and not on a deferment basis. What sort of arguments are we using, Ken, to convince the landlord to provide relief as waived rent rather than a deferred rent when they're entitled to, to defer a portion of it up to 50%? Yeah. Well, I think it what convinces yeah. them to provide yeah. it as waived rather than deferred. Look, I think you, you, you almost summed it up um, uh, when we were talking about the survive. Look, uh, the deferment rent is only really deferring the pain. Um, for uh, for a tenant and look, uh, look in order for a business um, to kind of get through this period they need the landlord to uh, work with um, with, with um, I guess with us or with with our clients um, obviously I think with with the landlord um, if you're a good paying tenant that has to have some substance or some regard um, uh, to the uh, negotiations, um, but it's it's about uh, bringing the landlord on the journey also uh, in uh, kind of sharing uh, their your experience of what the business is actually going through with them and translating. Look, it it's not easy. Uh, it does it does take time, but eventually, I think once we you can actually demonstrate to the landlord um, that the business is in serious trouble and they need help, they do I think eventually provide some form of relief. Yeah, exactly right. I think um, uh, sharing that compelling story with the landlord as to what is required for the business to come out the other side and continue to be a viable long-term tenant in the best interest of the landlord to get them on board and to provide what's required for that to happen rather than the alternative, which is another story that we have to tell, right? No, exactly. Look, and equally, like a tenant paying rent um, is better than no tenant. Um, that, that's one of the arguments also. Uh, look, yeah. uh, look the, the likelihood of a, a landlord um, finding a tenant in this market, it's, 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 probably, it's probably pretty slim. Yeah. Um, the reasonable recovery period, we've said that it's not really defined. How are we presenting that period to the landlord when we're starting negotiations around what assistance will be required and for how long? Yeah, look, I think it's uh, look equally with with this process. Also, it's all, it's good to be transparent with the landlord, um, and what 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 we are doing also with some of our clients, we're actually providing our the for, future forecast sales, um, presenting to the landlord just to uh, demonstrate the, the period um, in order for the for the business to get back to the pre-COVID levels. Um, look, based on our modelling, it could take anywhere from six, nine, even up to 12 months for a business uh, to get back to um, 80 to 90% of, of revenue um, at, at that time. And that's on the proviso uh, that the COVID um, ends within the next month or two. Yeah. Good, Ken. Uh, the last point I'll make on, on our strategic solutions is um, the objective of any lease negotiation and particularly uh, negotiations around COVID-19 stuff and trying to save businesses and, and make sure that they're viable post COVID-19 is that we want to return retail businesses back to a profitable, being a profitable business and ensuring that their, their lease is a saleable asset. Um, and that goes to the point where we're, we're looking at negotiating uh, new leases rather than extending the existing lease, making sure that that new lease, the commercial terms are uh, in line with what we expect um, the market conditions to be, which the outlook is fairly poor and negative at the moment, um, but ensuring that the, uh, the end result is, is a, that the tenant has a secure tenure in a premises that uh, essentially is a saleable asset and a profitable business, right? So, Beck, I think um, there's been some good discussion between ourselves. It was probably a good time to open up to some question and answers from, from the listeners who might have uh, got some stuff out of that. Yes, thank you, Kyle, and thank you, Ken. Um, so a question I've just got in chat. Um, how do you ensure the support being provided by the landlord for April and May will be sufficient for the business to survive the remainder of the time we have restrictions on trade? 
when we don't know what the impact will be on our business in June or September? I'll throw to you on that one, Ken. Yeah, no, thank, thanks, Mike. That's a good question. Uh, look, I think as we mentioned, as it's um, important to base any relief um, on the mandatory code of conduct as a minimum, um, look, the advice that we're actually providing to our clients is just to ensure any relief has regard to, um, I think I might have mentioned, the future forecast sales after the uh, job keeper period um, and to ensure that um, there, there is a separate negotiation or separate agreement um, for that post, uh, post-COVID post or post-job keeper. Uh, look, it's also equally important just to ensure um, any agreement uh, with the landlord is well documented um, and uh, there is a caveat reserving your right uh, to seek further relief um, in the event uh, there is a significant shift or trade in uh, in conditions. Lovely. Um, so I have a question. I had outstanding arrears dating back before the COVID period and was issued a notice to remedy just prior. Can the landlord still take action on this during this time? Um. Yeah, look, the, this is where it is. The code certainly provides protections for the tenant during the COVID-19 period and the, and the period of impact from COVID-19. Um, it, but it is also clear that uh, in stating that the tenant needs to meet their, their normal lease obligations and anything pre-existing COVID-19 um, can still be acted upon. Um, we, we certainly don't think it's fair or reasonable to for a landlord to act on on that situation during COVID-19. It's just a sure way to ensure business failure. Um, uh, in addressing that sort of situation with a landlord, we would certainly um, take a negotiated approach to uh, have them see some reason and try to return the business to... Um, uh, you know, viability post COVID nineteen when the remedy may be able to be addressed, um, but it's really going to come down to the uh, what you what picture you can paint to the landlord to encourage them to go on that journey with the tenant. And as Ken said, uh, a potential uh, rent paying tenant post COVID nineteen should be seen as a um, fairly important asset for the landlord right now because they're going to be quite difficult to find if there's a vacant shop there. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Marcus. The tenants who fall above the $50 million revenue threshold, is the landlord still barred from terminating the lease or drawing upon security, or is this restricted to tenants below the threshold? You want to take that one, Ken? It's very similar. But. Yeah, no, it's okay. Look, with regard to the 50 million, look, it, it does um, apply to uh, tenants with revenue um, below $50 million. But but their approach where we're taking um, um, for our clients is uh, regardless of whether the business turns over uh, below $50 million or above, the code should um, apply to all businesses. Look, everyone has uh, different circumstances. Um, and whilst um, uh, Scott Morris has mentioned that every business over $50 million should be able to weather the storm, uh, uh, it's not, not entirely correct. Everyone is, certainly has a different situation. And it's a matter of um, demonstrating to the landlord um, the, the, the hardship the business is actually going through. And, and I think I mentioned before, just bringing them on the journey um, through, through this time. I think the, the key for us in that situation, Ken, is that even though the business is over 50 million and not eligible for protections under the code, we're still dealing with individual stores and some stores are viable, some stores are, are profitable and some aren't. And so we're dealing with, we're reducing it down to a store level and, and it comes back again to the landlord, um, whether that particular landlord wants to apply the, the guiding principles as set out by uh, Prime Minister Morrison and uh, come to the table in good faith and have negotiations with us to ensure that that one particular store um, 
that they have a lease with survives, um, irrespective of how big the overall company is. Mm. Okay, great. Um, Kelly asks, where does the modelling for COVID and market conditions come from? Uh, I presume it's the modelling that she heard Ken mention. Um, that's, that's our work and Ken's work with um, clients of ours. So it has to come from the individual tenant that you're working with um, based on assumptions that they have around their business. Ken might touch on that a little bit more with the specific client that he was probably drawing on in that example. Yeah. Um, you know, look, I think Kyle's mentioned, look, it, it is very specific. Um, it, look, the, the data is just based on our discussions with, with our clients and other tenants. Um, look, everyone um, has to try and make a reasonable assumption of what the um, recovery period be. Um, and collectively, um, the average, I think I mentioned, is about anywhere from six, six to nine months. Look, hopefully, I think everyone wants to resume normal trade by Christmas. Um, but depending on how long COVID um, does um, run for, um, look, that, might, that might be longer. Okay, um, so I've got a question here. Do you see any scope to tie rents in the recovery period to any mutually agreed vacancy levels for a shopping centre or immediate precinct where you're trading? For example, like you might see when centres are in a redevelopment phase. Um, in principle, uh, essentially what you're talking about is a protection clause, and that's an amendment to a lease, essentially. Um, Landlords don't love protection clauses, so there's probably other ways to, to measure the return to pre-COVID conditions rather than uh, vacancy rates, which uh, can be linked to lots of other things. So it would be a harder way to go, um, but clearly if the centre you're in um, significantly increases in vacancy during this period, it, may prolong the period of your recovery um, but uh, yeah at the end of the day what we want is for a tenant's pre-COVID-19 um, turnover levels to to be returned after COVID-19 so that's probably the key measure whether there's vacancies or not um, but vacancy rates included as a as a thing. It's often used in new leases where it's a new development or a new shopping centre um, because someone wants to open and make sure that the, the centre is fully um, operational and not half operational. But in this situation, it's probably going to be a difficult um, clause to have included or, or measure recovery on. Thank you, Carl. Um, from Joanne. Joanne asks, would we be disadvantaged in negotiations if we traded with reduced sales as opposed to those who decided to close? Um, probably yes, because if you decide to close, you're immediately 100% impacted. You then have to, however, tell a compelling story to the landlord as to why you closed when it's not a mandatory um, closure under the government solutions. Um, and certainly landlords are treating that as um, not really being in good faith uh, in the way of both parties working together to, um, to get through this period. So um, there, there needs to be strong communication around that between the parties and um, definite understanding that it's based on concerns over safety for staff, um, uh, duty of care and, and those sorts of issues which would fully support. Um, but obviously the landlord would like stores open in their centre as well and what we're experiencing is they're using that as leverage to enter into negotiations around rent. Um, uh, so it, it's a difficult situation but um, if you're closed, impact is 100%. If you're trading, you need to prove what percentage of impact there is, whether it's 80% or 60% or whatever. Okay, uh, our next question is from Kerry. 
During our discussions with our landlords, two have advised that they have made errors on their rental rates and not passed on set CPI increases for two years. They have now billed us for these two years. How would you recommend that we respond on this as this was no error on our behalf? Ken? No, no, look, it's a good question. Look, obviously, um, typically what you'd probably have to do just to understand um, in the lease whether the landlord is able to kind of back charge any um, increases. Look, I suspect the, the landlord probably has a right um, to um, enforce those increases, but uh, you'd really have to just review the lease just to see what the provisions are. Look, in some cases, if a landlord does miss an opportunity for a review, they forego that. Uh, but it's really what's documented um, in, in the lease. And then in the context of COVID-19, um, it's not really in the spirit of the leasing uh, guidelines set out, particularly through COVID, uh, through the conduct code of conduct, um, which specifically freezes all increases in rent during the period. So, retrospectively, uh, introducing a missed rent increase could probably be convert, conveyed that way. But um, there's some reason, obviously, why they feel they want to do that, um, and uh, would would probably be trying to get to the bottom of that and understand why they uh, are doing that now and what the, the issues are around that. Okay, we've got Peter asking, has there been any discussions on percentage rent as an option rather than a fixed amount? Can can still with that? Yeah, really. no, it's okay. It's all right. Look, based on our experience, um, it, look, it is. It, look, everyone is different. Every landlord is different. We have um, had some discussions about percentage rent, and some landlords um, are happy to adopt, adopt that. Um, so yeah, no, certainly the answer is yes. Okay, that was a nice quick one. Teresa says, our, our landlord has insisted that we sign a confidentiality agreement prior to coming to the table to negotiate. Should we sign so negotiations start off on a good note or should we refuse to show we will not be easily pushed over? Um, it is kind of standard that uh, NDAs are included in a lot of lease negotiations. Um, generally, when you agree to a uh, rental abatement agreement or something like that with a landlord, the, the incentive deed provided around that will include uh, um, non-disclosure clauses within it anyway. So um, I think it's fair and reasonable for the landlord to expect that what they're providing you remains confidential. Um, we are a little concerned that uh, the landlords have sought approval from the ACCC that allows them to share information about um, rent relief packages they're providing to tenants, so centre group and, and other landlords are party to that. Um, so I would, I, I would be happy to uh, advise a client to sign their NDA, but I would ask that the NDA is a two-way NDA, um, so non-disclosure from either party. I, I wouldn't, particularly where you've got multiple stores um, and other, other interests, um, you don't want one agreement applying to your entire portfolio. So. If the disclosure agreement um, provides for the landlord also to remain, uh, keep the information confidential, then I, I don't have any concerns around that. Thank you, Kyle. Um, we have gone over time, so only one final question, unfortunately. Um, Bob is the tenant of a cafe which closed on the 25th of March. He sought rental relief under the code, which was 50% waiver, 50% deferral. The landlord has since responded, no, he wants payment of 60% of the rent and will use the bond as top up. Bob wants to know, is he out of line? What's the go here? You want that one, Ken? That's an easy one. Right, you, you can have that one, Carl. <laughs> it is, look, this is an easy one. I, I presume your cafe is covered under the code. I don't know too many 
cafe is doing more than 50 mil a year. So I would presume uh, you are uh, covered under the code. I would make sure that you go onto the ATO website and apply for the JobKeeper program so that you can show that you are eligible under JobKeeper, um, therefore eligible for the provisions of the code of conduct. And under the code of conduct, these are mandatory conditions um, and quite simply, the landlord's offer it doesn't meet the minimum expectation of that. Um, so no, I wouldn't be accepting that that proposal from the landlord. Um, uh, we would start there, let's say. All right. Well, I hope that helped, Bob. Um, if you want some more advice, you can give us an email um, after this. Um, so it's now 1.30, we've gone 15 minutes over time, but thank you very much for joining us again this week, Kyle, and Ken, for you as well, coming along this week. Um, we've got the link for next week's webinar in the chat. Um, Kyle, what can we expect from next week? I'm not sure yet. Uh, we'll see what this week brings. Um, it, it seems from all the question and answers, it, it's good going to have more to do with landlord responses and how to overcome some of the barriers being put in front. I think I think uh, it probably would have been good to look at um, what is considered reasonable and uh, reasonable uh, financial data to be asked for by a landlord in order to prove impact. Um, and Ken and I'll probably have a chat about what our clients are experiencing, what what um, what the landlords are talking to us about, and come up with something topical that everyone is facing at the moment, and see if we can provide some guidance on that. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you, everyone who's been attending, and um, make sure you register for next week's session. We'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Cheers.